section twenty one of the early tudors by charles edward moberly this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter fifteen the yorkist conspiracy anne of cleves six articles the fall of cromwell fifteen thirty eight to fifteen thirty nine part one it seemed fated that revolts against henry should fail for want of combination this as we have seen had been the case with the conspiracy of the nobles and the two acts of the pilgrimage of grace and now the fourth division of the same general movement was to be managed still more impotently and to bring still wider ruin on its promoters the house of york in fifteen thirty eight chiefly represented by the marquis of exeter whose mother lady courtney was edward the fourth's daughter and by lady salisbury who was the daughter of george duke of clarence niece to king edward and sister to the earl of warwick who had perished with warbeck the sons of this venerable lady were lord montague and arthur reginald and geoffrey pole the marquis of exeter had unwillingly joined in the suppression of the pilgrimage of grace yet remained bitterly hostile to cromwell and the new teaching since then he had been complained of as hindering the course of justice in his own county and now information came from members of his household that he was raising men in cornwall with the view of getting himself named heir to the crown and from a painter at the turbulent cornish village of st kevern that orders had been given for a banner of the five wounds on farther inquiry it appeared that the tenacious cornishman had not forgotten blackheath field and still longed to overthrow the tudor dynasty that the poles shared in the plot was presently made too clear by the cowardice of sir geoffrey who to shield himself volunteered evidence that his brother lord montague and lord and lady exeter were all in correspondence with cardinal reginald pole the danger was serious for other evidence showed that paul the third was plotting a spanish conquest of ireland and had sent pole to liege that he might be near enough to hold all the threads of the intrigue together and worst of all the emperor had for some unexplained purpose collected two hundred ships at antwerp the strongest measures were therefore adopted exeter and montague were put on their trial and condemned not for the conspiracy which it was better to keep as secret as possible but as traitors in word lady exeter and lady salisbury were attainted and imprisoned in the tower on this occasion henry asked the judges whether parliament could attaint without giving any reason their reply was that the question was dangerous that parliament is bound to set an example not of lawlessness but of justice yet that if it did so deal with any one his attainder would hold it might have been expected that being thus attacked by the pope would have made henry more protestant yet it had not this effect as he seemed still anxious to prove himself as faithful as any rebel could be to the old religion undeterred by a danger which after all had not been extreme he also really hated as we have seen the spirit of ribaldry which had set in under the pretence of religion to meet this he first published an earnest and even touching exhortation to decent reverence in externals and then after proclaiming an amnesty for past offences against religion set himself to consider how they might be prevented in the future even on the principles of our own time some punishment was required to check disorder for bible reading aloud in church had been made an excuse for interrupting the service and abusing its minister and if a zealous protestant disliked any church ceremony he was not unlikely to rate the clergyman performing it and tell him loudly that he did not some were reported as common singers against the sacraments and ceremonies others as players of interludes railing on the priesthood others again as mimicking the elevation of the host with the most odious profanity to deal with this state of things a commission was formed of cromwell the two archbishops and six bishops representing various parties but as these could not agree on their report 
or at any rate did not send it in at once the duke of norfolk moved in the house of lords that parliament as a whole should discuss the main points of controversy and settle the law concerning them the result was an act imposing by lay authority alone the celebrated six articles the very sound of which was thought certain to daunt the profane in the first of these transubstantiation the very antithesis of protestantism was again and finally affirmed any one denying it was to be burned without any chance of saving himself by retractation in the next four communion in one kind was asserted to be sufficient the observance of vows of chastity was enjoined and private masses and auricular confession maintained whoever twice denied any of these was to suffer death as a felon all marriages contracted by priests were pronounced void and the wives were to be dismissed by a certain day to refuse communion or confession was also felony of course if this act had been fully enforced there would have been a persecution worthy of alva or torquemada and for a few days the risk of this appeared considerable as in the city of london where the roman party formed a committee at mercer's hall and denounced not less than five hundred of their fellow-citizens as heretics but the king was not inclined to persecute on this scale he allowed the accused to be securities for one another and so dismissed them partly from his backwardness and partly from cromwell's opposition the six articles though professedly in force for eight years were really so only at intervals and when henry gave permission as there were four of these short persecutions in the remainder of the reign some of them specially cruel and costing on the whole twenty-seven lives the result of the act is sufficiently lamentable not to need exaggerations historians therefore should not have spoken of gardiner and the bishops as daily sending men to the stake under it one of its first consequences was that cranmer sent his wife abroad and latimer and shaxton were deprived of their sees at about the same time an act of parliament vested the abbey lands in the king and those to whom he granted them thus establishing as mr hallam remarks the wealth of great families like the russells who were to be famous in after years and at last to become the surest barrier against tyranny in england so was completed the dissolution of the monasteries which every historian must be glad at last to dismiss unhappily some of its last scenes were also the ugliest as when the abbot of glastonbury who had hidden his plate in the hope of better times was hanged for his crime at the top of the tor close by to be seen far and wide across the somersetshire plain in strong contrast with such horrors stands the admission of wales into the english polity which is the most honourable thing henry ever did indeed its effect on welsh turbulence has been compared by burke to the calming of the tempest when the twins are first seen above the horizon according to existing laws no welshman could buy land or house in or near any city or town in the marches or be a burgess of any corporate english town or an apprentice in any english town whatever the manufacture and import of armour was forbidden in wales and all welsh meetings were unlawful except by special licence the vernacular poet glyncothy complains bitterly that his furniture had been confiscated on his presuming to marry an englishwoman had he been english and his wife welsh he would have forfeited all franchises and made himself a welshman in the eye of the law unlike his father henry the eighth thought much of the principality in the latter years of his reign and it was settled by various statutes that the english law alone should be current there that instead of the despotic jurisdiction of the lord's marchers justices of the peace should be established and hold sessions in each county twice a year that welsh-born subjects should have the same privileges as englishmen and that each county and each county town should send a member to parliament as raids into england might still happen it was ordered that no ferry-boat should take any welshman across the severn by night and by way of compliment to this 
English disorder was repressed by the vigour of Roland Lee, the warden of the marches, both in Cheshire, which had long presumed on its privileges as a county palatine not subject to the royal courts, by sending bands out to plunder neighbouring counties, and in Shropshire and Herefordshire, which used their positions on the border for the same purpose. When Henry's hand was refused by the Duchess of Milan, Cromwell, finding the six articles passed in spite of him, devised a singularly bold plan for saving Protestantism in England by marrying Henry to some lady who would lead him in that direction. Anne, sister to the Duke of Cleves, seemed well suited for this purpose, for the Duke was a Protestant, and his dominions, which included Juliesberg and part of Hanover, placed him in the closest connection with the Protestant states of Hesse and Saxony, and with Hermann, Archbishop of Cologne, who was already showing the Protestant tendencies which led to his deposition in 1543. He was therefore a most important member of the Schmalkaldic League against the Emperor, which had been formed in 1531, and had on the 10th of July, 1536, been enlarged and renewed for ten years, the contingent of troops which each of its members was to supply being also arranged against emergencies. Moreover, he had claims on Gelderland, which, if established, would make his territory like an open gate for anyone wishing to attack the emperor, either in Holland or Germany, and having France for an ally. Cromwell, therefore, threw his whole force into the negotiation, hoping thus to checkmate the party which had carried the six articles and which wished to see Charles invade England. On the 27th of December, 1539, the lady landed at Deal. On the 31st, Henry met her at Rochester and found her lamentably unlike Holbein's portrait, quite devoid of accomplishments, knowing no language but her own, and much marked with the smallpox. His consternation was extreme. He could hardly utter a word, and forgot to take from his pocket the present which he had prepared. Foreigners in those days were sometimes half surprised and more than half amused at our caring so much for female beauty, and Henry was as English in this point as his father had been. Hardly would he have submitted to such an infliction even for a cherished purpose of his own, much less for one with which he only half sympathized. Could not a pre-contract be made out? No, the lady was very decidedly free and after all it would not do to throw the duke into the alliance between Charles and Francis, which was now assuming the most threatening appearance, Charles being actually on a visit to the French court, and ominously refusing all inquiry into the treatment of Englishmen in Spain by the Inquisition. So the marriage took place on the 6th of January, 1540, hateful though it was to the bridegroom, and unpopular because of the risk from it to Flemish trade. For the next five months a life-and-death struggle went on between the two religious parties. Cromwell seemed for a while to be scoring at all points. He was created Earl of Essex on the 17th of April, and afterwards a Knight of the Garter, and succeeded in imprisoning some of his antagonists or driving them from the council. It was expected every day that Gardiner would be sent to the tower. The minister also carried the attainder of some priests, one of Queen Catherine's household, who had been contumacious ever since, and succeeded in checking the action of the Six Articles and in abolishing many rites of sanctuary. But all the time his main scheme was collapsing miserably. He could not persuade Francis to join the League of Protestant Germany, and its members in alarm made their peace with Charles for the time. This was the opportunity for which Cromwell's enemies had been waiting. Now their charges, carefully gathered for years, might securely be hurled at him. On the 10th of June, Henry allowed him to be arrested at the council table, the other members loudly proclaiming him a traitor and tearing the ribbon of the garter from his neck. He was immediately attainted on eight charges, the substance of which was that he had planned to crush the nobles of England and to form a confederacy of heretics in the country by
by means of which he might raise a rebellion he was truly or falsely sworn to have said that if the king and realm varied from his opinions he would fight against them sword in hand and that if he lived a year or two he would bring matters to such a state that the king would have no power to change it even if he desired events then rushed on with lightning speed the attainder was passed by acclamation about the nineteenth of june on the first of july norfolk and the new government carried a bill for the better observance of the six articles on the seventh the king's late marriage was brought before convocation and annulled on the wonderful plea that it had been extorted under compulsion by external causes on the twelfth an act of parliament was carried to the same effect and anne of cleves intending to remain in england was endowed with three thousand pounds a year in the grotesque title of the king's sister on the twenty eighth cromwell laid his head on the block and two days later barnes garrett and jerome who had rashly put themselves forward as opponents of gardiner were sent at the stake as gainsayers of the six articles the priests attainted by cromwell being hanged at the same place and time for denying the supremacy soon after this parliament which had in the previous year given to henry's proclamation the force of laws thus going near to establish a kind of turkish despotism in the state did nearly the same in church matters by enabling a committee of the archbishops bishops and certain doctors of divinity acting with the king's sanction that is the king himself to declare absolutely the judgment of the english church on all questions of theology whether raised here or on the continent and to enforce it by pains and penalties End of section 21